Okay, good evening. Uh, welcome to Powder to the People's third and final backcountry uh, discussion tonight. Uh, this is in uh, collaboration with the Colorado Avalanche Information Center uh, and local forecaster Brian McCall, who's in the back. I guess I should introduce myself. I'm Mike Marolt, and uh, I've done a couple of events with these guys because it's uh, a very important subject, and uh, we can get into that in a little bit. But let me just go through some of the formalities here. Um, this is the only free educational um, type of seminar on avalanches uh, in, in our valley, so I'm glad to see a big crowd here, and uh, so thanks for all of that. Um, the format for tonight's uh, program, Brian will give the first presentation on current backcountry conditions and avalanche activity. Um, then we have special guests, Arabelle and Jason Beavers, who uh, were, were unfortunately caught in an avalanche um, a couple weeks ago, and so they're going to share their experience, and, and uh, there's no better way than, than living through somebody else's um, misfortune to uh, understand the severity of what we're talking about and to also gain knowledge to try and uh, uh, help avoid stuff uh, in our own, our own adventures. Um, so they will be getting up and talking. If, you have, if anybody has any questions uh, uh, throughout the presentation, just put your hand up, and, and then what I'll do is I'll bring the uh, microphone over to you so that uh, we can get it on grassroots and um, so that we can uh, uh, tape everybody's questions to make the, the uh, taping more meaningful. Um, just a quick reminder that the Beacon Basin is open at Aspen Highlands to practice your transceiver search skills. It's free, open 24-7 on the flats below Golden Horn uh, above Thunderbolt. And... Um, their powder to the people is happy to bring this free community service, but please consider making a donation. We're trying to build up uh, powder to the people to um, bring events like this to um, the community. And, and, and really, in my 25 years of experience, you know, climbing and skiing all over the world, the, the, the one thing that I think has really helped me in my career is, is going to seminars like this hearing from experts like Brian, and, and also reading mountaineering storybooks, because mountaineering storybooks don't make it to the, the bookstore unless they're epics, and you can learn a lot through other people's mistakes. But, but we have an opportunity here tonight to not only learn firsthand from people who have experienced uh, avalanches. Brian is one of the foremost experts, and, and you can have a lot of experience, and you can be out in the field, and you can dig your pits, and you can do everything right, but to, to, to not accept the fact that by listening to people like Brian give you a bird's eye view of what's going on, and this is what he does for a living, it, it's just not arming yourself with one more piece of information to, to really give you uh, all of the advantage that you need when you enter into the backcountry. So um, it's very important, and uh, the goal for Powder to the People is to you know, get all the backcountry skiers in here because this is critical information and uh, it's very useful. So, um, without further ado, we'll bring uh, Brian on and he can give his presentation and then uh, we'll get into uh, Arabelle and Jason and, and then if you have any questions, just let me know and I'll bring the microphone to you guys. So here is Brian McCall. Okay, you're not allowed to call me an expert because we all know what happens to the experts, right? So. <laughs> I did another talk a couple of weeks ago and one of the guys that I learned from initially had this quote in one of his talks and he's been a forecaster, a guide, an educator for over 20 years and he said the only thing I know after 20 years as an avalanche professional is that I'm barely good enough to do my job. So if that gives you an indication of that learning curve, <laughs> I thought that was a really good quote along there, and I feel the same way. So, um, just a couple things I wanted to go over tonight. Uh, quick look as to where we're at for snowpack. Um, some numbers I pulled up from yesterday. I noticed there's some tissues in the bathroom if anybody needs those for that end of the discussion. Um, we've had a really interesting three weeks with avalanches not only in the Aspen area, but statewide in Colorado. We've had countless deep slab avalanches running near full track, 
um, very destructive hard slabs. And I wanted to go into some of the weather events throughout this winter that led up to this last three weeks of avalanche activity. Um, coming into the spring skiing season here, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the melt freeze cycle, safe travel in the springtime. I'll try not to keep it too scientific, but there is a little bit of science involved into understanding it. And then we'll move into the avalanche from Independence Pass at the end of it. <clears throat> All right, these are a couple of our local weather stations. This is Independence Pass um, as of yesterday. So the blue and purple lines up on top are the mean and median um, snow water equivalents for the last 30 years, going back to, I think for this particular graph, it's about 1981 through um, 2010 on there. So that's our average snowpack year here. The red line is 2012 and the green line is this year. So up until a couple of days ago, we were actually behind in snowfall um, from last year, which we all remember uh, was a fairly dry year. It should, last March was fairly unique and we can see our snowpack melted off about a month early last spring. So assuming we continue to get even a couple of snowstorms through March and April this year, we should have no problem surpassing 2012, but kind of depressing look at, at what's going on. Things look a little bit better in the Crystal River Valley. Um, this is North Lost Trail, so just above the town of Marble. Um, again, just surpassed 2012 in snowfall, but we're still below our average snowpack, at least our 30 year average snowpack for this area. So we got a long ways to go. <clears throat> All right, very interesting few weeks this season. Um, starting about the 1st of March, we started to see these large deep slab avalanches failing at the ground, running throughout the state. Um, I don't think I've seen a day in our observation database since the 1st of March where there hasn't been a natural or a triggered deep slab avalanche going uh, in the backcountry. The, uh, these large avalanches, the first human involvement we saw was the death near Cameron Pass on March 2nd. <clears throat> um, two guys were skiing, both of them were buried, and a fairly amazing survival story. If you guys have a chance to read that accident report, it's a fairly lengthy one, but there's a lot to be learned from this particular incident. Uh, the guy that survived was buried for about three hours and somehow survived this one. Um, it was a group of state park employees that dug him out ultimately in there. So really interesting case. Um, <clears throat> And we've seen, as I said, we've seen natural and human triggered deep slab avalanches almost every day. The most recent one I saw, we had some naturals this afternoon in the West Willow drainage about three o'clock with all the new snow and strong winds we had today. And we also had a very large snowmobile triggered avalanche up near Montezuma uh, yesterday, uh, just above the town of Keystone in there as well. So almost daily occurrences. Um, I just threw in a photo of that Cameron Pass avalanche um, and it gives a good idea. This thing was almost 1,200 feet wide. Um, the guys triggered it from about here, somewhere in this area. But when the avalanche failed, the crown of that went across this slope, came down around here, and it went out of the photo to the left there, almost an equal distance to what you see in there. Ran down into... Uh, into the timber down in here, did break some mature trees, so fairly large, destructive avalanche. Um, and these east and northeast aspects have kind of been the most common um, slope aspect that we've seen these deep slab avalanches happening on as well. Okay, so why, why are we seeing so many of these? Um, I had a reporter ask me last week, is this a normal occurrence in Colorado or is this a fairly unusual cycle that we're seeing? Um, it's not uncommon that we see these deep slab avalanches. What's unusual is how frequently they've occurred through the latter part, uh, late winter, early spring months here. So that's been a fairly unique situation that's going on out there. Um, contributing factors to these deep slab avalanches, certainly below average snowfall. Um, 
lower snowpack weak layer. Um, I'll go into some of the reasons that we formed this weak layer down near the base of the snowpack. In particular, the last couple of weeks of January were one of the main reasons that we're seeing these large avalanches right now. <clears throat> we switched from um, fairly dry weather overall in January to light but consistent snowfall in February. And that started to add some stress to that lower snowpack weak layer. Um, and then getting a little more specific, March 5th, we had a really windy day. We had a cold front that came through with, a, with some really intense precipitation. That kind of kicked off this cycle in the, in the Aspen area um, on that afternoon of the 5th. And then right around the 5th of March, about the 4th to the 8th of March, we saw four days of really strong southwest winds. And that kind of put us over the top for uh, stress on those lower snowpack weak layers. <clears throat> Okay, so I looked, uh, I looked this morning at some of these snow tail stations, Roaring Fork Valley, the main Roaring Fork Valley, we're still about 74% of our precipitation as of this morning. Anytime we've got a below average snowpack year, we tend to see more of these persistent weak layers in the snowpack. The years that have closer to normal or above normal precipitation, we generally have a bit stronger of a snowpack. Um, so we see a lot of faceted snow grains, some very, very weak depth or near the ground as a result of the shallow snowpack that we've got this year. Anytime you've got a shallow snowpack and cooler cold temperatures, we're going to have a lot of weak layers that are forming. And that's definitely been the case this winter. Um, the other thing with the shallow snowpack is that lower snowpack weak layer is just closer to the surface. So our weight traveling in the backcountry as a skier, a snowboarder, on our snowmobile especially, is putting more stress on that weak layer that's near the ground than we would if that snowpack was a bit deeper on an average year. So kind of the ideal um, depth for human-triggered avalanches is anywhere from you know 50 to 80 centimeters or so deep um, into the snowpack. And unfortunately, in a lot of places, that lower snowpack weak layer is right at that depth. So kind of perfect for triggering. Um, going back into January, um, we had, if I can remember my storms, I think the first week of January was fairly cool and dry. We had a small storm uh, between the 10th and the 13th of January. And then after the 13th, we had about two weeks of uh, dry weather and very cold conditions. And again, shallow snowpack back in January, cold temperatures, we started to form a really, really weak snowpack um, during those last two weeks. Uh, if you look at the Aspen zone, what we call the Aspen zone is our forecast area. Um, everything around the town of Aspen, all of our, you know, Maroon Creek, Castle Creek Valleys, Independence Pass, and then going up to the north towards uh, the Frying Pan and the Holy Cross Range, that entire region, um, the snowpack was almost, was made up of entirely weak faceted snow, uh, snow grains and depth or. So we started to see these loose snow avalanches towards the end of January, where if you got onto a steep north facing slope and with one little ski cut, you could start these slow moving sloughs of these faceted snow grains that would just scour out to the ground. So there was no strength to the snowpack whatsoever um, towards the end of January. Um, and this is kind of what we were looking at. This is towards the end of January. This is out in McFarland's. And with just a couple of, couple of tracks across the top of this slope, you could see that snowpack would just start to slough um, and scour out almost all the way down to the ground. So very weak snowpack, no strength, no bonds in between grains. Um, wasn't a great start to the uh, middle part of our winter this year. <clears throat> so certainly those, that dry period, last two weeks of January, um, one of the things that's causing our deep slab problem right now. As we got into February, we started to see a shift in the weather. Um, we didn't have any really large storms during the month of February, but it snowed just about every day. Um, I looked back at some of the snowfall records 
and all but five or six days in the month of February had some measurable uh, precipitation. It might have been one or two or three inch accumulations, but it snowed just about every day um, through the month of February. And that process started to add some stress to that weak layer that we formed um, at the end of January. And we weren't seeing too many large deep flab avalanches in February, but we were starting to see a few more avalanches being triggered um, lower in the snowpack during that month. Okay, then getting back into early March. Uh, starting on the 4th of March, we, wind speeds increased quite a bit out of the southwest and they stayed strong uh, for four days, um, consistently uh, strong enough to transport snow, especially above tree line. And that particular wind event formed very thick, very hard slab on top of the snowpack sitting above all those weak faceted snow grains that we saw at the base of the snowpack from January. Um, kind of in that same time frame, March 2nd was that accident up at Cameron Pass. Um, March 5th, we saw a pretty significant natural cycle in the Aspen area here. So things were really starting to, avalanche activity was really starting to increase during those first seven days of March um, statewide. Locally, I mentioned earlier, 5th of March, we had a fast moving storm that came through. Um, local weather stations, you know, up on Highlands Bowl, Snowmass had gusts into the 70 mile hour range um, on that afternoon of, of March 5th. And we also had eight or 10 inches of snow in just a couple hours during that afternoon. Um, that kind of kicked off a fairly significant cycle of natural avalanches. And from about the 5th of March up until today, we've continued to see those large avalanches occurring. And it was mostly related to um, wind loading that uh, those avalanches started occurring. So that wind loading uh, kind of formed a slab that was thick enough and hard enough um, for the avalanches to really start going pretty big. Um, during that March 5th afternoon, we saw quite a few avalanches that were occurring in the upper half of the snowpack. So that storm snow from that day, maybe some wind flaps from that day. And we started to see just a handful of avalanches failing at the ground on that afternoon. And then again, those winds um, the next three days. So it was somewhat unusual that the storm ended on the 5th. And then on the 6th, 7th, and 8th of March, the winds continued to be strong, skies cleared up. It was after the storm, um, but it was that wind event that actually really increased the avalanche danger in the backcountry. <clears throat> and lots of information on here. This is a snow profile from, one, from the Cameron Pass accident. Um, kind of the takeaway piece of information here. These are just hand hardnesses of each layer in the snowpack. So the further out to the left that that bar extends, the more dense that layer is. So this is kind of what our snowpack looks like when you get above tree line right now. You've got this fairly thick hard slab in the middle of the snowpack, and then the strength of that layer decreases as you go towards the ground. So that's a fairly ugly looking snowpack, and that's what you're gonna find throughout the state of Colorado, kind of near and above tree line right now. Strong middle and upper snowpack and a very, very weak lower snowpack. <clears throat> um, when our, a couple of our forecasters went to that accident site at Cameron Pass the day after, and usually when we do a snow pit at the site of the accident, we try and find one particular weak layer that we might call the cause of that avalanche, the reason that they were involved. This particular pit had so many weak layers in it that it was really hard to pick out one that was the, um, you know, the exact or the exact weak layer that they triggered. Um, there was a bunch of weak layers in the upper part of that snowpack, probably stepped down towards the ground in that weak layer at the ground. So there's been fairly good photography opportunities around the state. This was March 5th on Highlands Ridge. I'll just run through a few of these pretty quick. March 7th, um, Garrett Peak uh, in the <clears throat> East Snowmass Creek drainage. 
that one ran probably early morning on the 7th. Northeast aspect, this is the 9th of March, uh, north aspect on Independence Pass on Green Mountain, ran to the ground, um, full track, kind of crossed Highway 82, um, right below this path. This one is another northeast facing slope. This one was March 15th, and this is Green Mountain on Independence Pass. <clears throat> I've skied up there a lot. I'm not sure if I've ever seen that path actually run. This is another one from that weekend of the, if I can remember my days, I think the 16th or 17th, I believe, is a weekend um, down in the San Juans. And this is, this is kind of what we've been seeing is these big chunks of hard slab debris in these avalanches. So this is, this is the debris from that avalanche right there. This was uh, this past weekend, <coughs> excuse me, this past weekend over near Vail. Um, this one was skier triggered. It's a little hard to see, but there's tracks that came in here and came along just above that avalanche right there. <coughs> Another natural near Vail um, last weekend as well. So they've kind of continued for the past three weeks. We just keep seeing these large destructive avalanches. Um, most of them failing either at or near the ground. You can see this one is kind of run to the ground here. And there's another pocket there uh, where it failed right at the ground. So really big, really scary stuff. <clears throat> So certainly there's been lots of descriptions in our observations uh, in the past few weeks of these car-sized blocks and these avalanches. Most of these formed during that wind event, uh, the 4th through the 8th of March. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens today. We had some really, really strong winds and intense blowing snow this afternoon. We probably got more avalanches just like this. Um, this one is over near Leadville. Um, Weston Pass area, and this was uh, an avalanche course through CMC, it was traveling um, in some flat terrain below this slope, and they triggered it from the flats, you know, probably a thousand feet away from where the avalanche actually started. So a pretty good learning experience for the class. They were able to walk up into that debris and just see how destructive this avalanche was. <clears throat> okay. Okay, any questions before I move on? Those deep slab avalanches, pretty interesting cycle. So that was kind of the, you know, late January, that dry period formed the weak layer. February started to form the slab with that new snow. And then that wind and the storm in early March kind of pushed us over the edge there. Um, someday we'll have a stable snowpack and we'll be able to go spring skiing. <laughs> so I thought we'd talk about that a little bit since it's moving into that season. A um, little bit about the spring snowpack, few ideas for safe travel, timing, things like that. Resources for weather stations, um, and a little bit about snowpack metamorphism through the springtime. So what we're starting into is sun angles getting higher, the temperatures are getting warmer, and we start to get into this melt-freeze cycle. Snowpack melts during the day, gets a little bit weaker when it's melted and then it refreezes at night and gets a little bit stronger. And we start to get into this cycle of melting and refreezing. We call that our melt-freeze metamorphism. So even though the single-digit temperatures didn't feel like spring this morning, <laughs> it's going to happen eventually. <clears throat> uh, certainly one thing we look at is air temperatures. You get a mild air temperature above freezing, upper layers in that snowpack start to melt dur during the day. Um, when they're wet, they're weak, and then at night they refreeze. So we certainly can see some melting and refreezing occur, even if the air temperatures are just slightly below freezing. So you can get a little bit of shortwave radiation impacting a steep slope during the day, especially in March and April when that sun angle is a little bit higher. And you can have this melt-freeze process occur, even though temperatures are maybe near or slightly below freezing. Um, don't get a whole lot of rain on our snowpack, thank goodness. 
Um, but certainly rain can bring on this melt freeze process as well. <clears throat> okay, and we'll go into this idea of wet metamorphism. And so what happens with the melting and refreezing process during the day when, the, when we've got a little bit of liquid water um, in that snowpack, we start to see some of the smaller snow grains disappear. They become a liquid. And what happens over time is these smaller grains will disappear. They'll become liquid during the day. And then at night, they'll refreeze onto the larger grains next to them. So the grain size within the snowpack becomes larger over time. The small grains disappear. Um, and we end up with what we call corn snow. You guys have probably heard this term. Um, this is what it looks like during the day when it's in that wet stage. Not a lot of bonds in between those individual grains. When it refreezes at night, it takes on an appearance like that, where you've got four or five, six, seven, eight um, old snow grains all bonded together. Um, here's the original rounded grain, and that was water during the day and refroze at night. Sort of looks like corn. I can see where that came from. <laughs> um, certainly we have those days that are really warm maybe we don't get a good freeze overnight and we get this really saturated snowpack and if you guys have heard this term slush it's simply about a 50 50 mix of water and snow grains in there very weak when it's in that phase when we first go into this melt freeze process in the springtime uh, we're just forming crusts near the surface of the snowpack. So maybe, you know, three, four, or five inches will melt during the daytime, um, early in March, refreeze at night, and you've got this thin melt freeze crust on the surface of the snowpack. If you dig down through that crust right now, you still have midwinter slabs and weak layers that exist in the lower part of that snowpack. So that process does take time. It starts as a thin crust and slowly that crust gets thicker and thicker until we've got an entire snowpack that is just one layer. Um, the melt freeze process, we need high daytime temperatures, strong solar radiation to really get it going. So clear days are ideal. And then we wanna see our temperatures dip below freezing at night. And ideally to form good corn skiing, a safer snowpack, we need this process to go on for an extended period of time. Um, rain does it. Like I said, we don't see a whole lot of it here in the mountains. Sunny aspects, so our south facing terrain tends to form um, a stronger snowpack, good corn skiing er earlier in the year. Um, and steeper slopes go through that transition faster as well. So a steeper slope has a little more direct um, view into the sun, if you will and that radiation coming from the sun is impacting that slope uh, more directly, and that'll transition into that melt freeze cycle much quicker. So a couple thoughts for, for spring touring. Okay, certainly one thing we wanna consider when you're making your spring tour plans is get a look at how well that snowpack froze overnight, and we'll hopefully give you guys a couple of good tools to figure that out. Um, you want to look at temperatures overnight and temperatures that are reported by the Aspen Airport don't do us a whole lot of good for touring in the mountains during the springtime. Uh, there's a couple higher elevation weather stations you can look at to get that information. The other important piece of this is your cloud cover overnight. Um, overcast skies during the nighttime hours tend to not have a very good freeze in the snowpack, and we'll go into why that occurs. Okay, so to grab temperature information, something you should be thinking about um, either in the morning before you head out on that spring tour or even start looking at it the night before, um, you can go onto the CAI website. We've got a list of weather stations that are available by each of the forecast zones that CEIC forecasts for. Um, Colorado.gov slash avalanche is our website. <clears throat> and this is our homepage here on the top. If you go to observations, 
and then observation reports, you'll get these options here. And if you click on weather stations, you'll get a drop down list of all the different forecast zones and you get all the weather stations by zone. So this is the Aspen zone. Um, these are sorted by elevation. So the low elevation stations are here and then they increase in elevation as you go up. Um, this particular table gives you a quick summary. You can look at the temperature column. It'll give you current and then max and min. So if you're, <clears throat> if you're looking for you know, a zone-wide summary of what's been going on with the temperatures, that's a quick way to um, get that information. And the other thing you can do is come over on the left and you can click on the individual station. So if you're going up Independence Pass for some spring skiing, click on that station and you'll get a graph and you also get the hourly output from that station as well. So if you do better with raw data and you like sorting through those numbers, um, it's not in this photo, but it's just off the bottom of the screen here. Uh, and this is the graph. So this is the uh, dark lines are every 12 hours in there uh, going back in time to the left. So you can quickly get a look at what's happened with the temperatures in the past 36 hours or so on this graph. And ideally for good, safe spring skiing and good quality corn skiing, you definitely want to see, you know, four or five, six hours of temperatures below freezing at night. That would be ideal. This is your freezing line right on here. So this is just going back a couple of days. If we look at that period right there, warm daytime temperatures and not a very good overnight freeze. So if that were a spring skiing day, I'd be thinking about maybe getting an earlier start or possibly doing a shorter tour because I know that that freeze in the upper snowpack is not going to last very long before you've got a saturated snowpack there. <clears throat> okay, and the other piece of this, the sky cover, um, the best resource for this is the National Weather Service. If you pull up a forecast for Aspen and at the top right hand side of the page, they have current conditions from the Aspen airport on there. This is this morning. So if you go over to this portion, um, you've got current conditions at the airport. And if you click on three day history right there, you can pull up sky cover for the last three days. And this is super useful information for your spring tours. A couple of abbreviations on here. That one's fairly obvious, a few clouds. So less than one eighth cloud cover out there and then the rest of these clear skies that's overcast uh, broken would be more than 50 percent cloud cover on there so if you look back at the nighttime hours before you're planning a spring ski tour and you see overcast skies or broken skies lots of cloud cover out there uh, you're probably not going to have a very thick freeze in that snowpack ideally we're seeing a few clouds or clear skies through the through the overnight hours so that's probably the easiest way to access those cloud cover conditions. Um, why does it matter? Because we all want to have good corn skiing. That's exactly why it matters. So the ideal overnight is clear skies and temperatures that dip below freezing. If you take away the freezing temps or if you add in an overcast night, you've probably got kind of a shallow freeze in that snowpack. Things will melt out much quicker in the morning um, and the avalanche danger will increase much quicker as well. And we'll talk a little bit about why this occurs. Hopefully it's not too scientific, but it has to do with the balance between long wave and short wave radiation and how it affects the snowpack in the springtime. So the long wave radiation, certainly the sun is a source and then any solid object rocks, trees, things like that also emit long wave radiation as we do as well. So it's heat that you can't see. It's a source of heat for the snowpack. It does melt the snowpack, um, but it's that part of the wavelength spectrum that we can't see. And then our visible light is the short wave radiation. <clears throat> so during the day, sun's up, we've got a source of both long wave and short wave radiation coming from the sun. On a clear day, 
that short wave radiation will hit the snow surface and somewhere around 80 or 90 percent of that will be reflected back out won't actually get absorbed by the snowpack um, the thing that will change that if we have a really dirty snow surface as we sometimes see um, late in the springtime if we get one of those dust events that have dust onto the snow surface that will increase the amount of shortwave radiation that gets absorbed into the snow um, this particular diagram shows that shortwave radiation may be penetrating about 40 centimeters into the snowpack. That would be in ideal conditions, low density snow and very clean white snow as well. More likely that shortwave radiation is only melting the upper two, three inches um, of that snowpack. Doesn't penetrate very far. Um, if you've got cloud cover, a good chunk of that shortwave radiation will get bounced off the clouds. But as we know, we still have light coming through the clouds during the day. So some of it makes it through the clouds, but some of it is also reflected back. And then the long wave piece of this puzzle, <clears throat> we do have long wave radiation coming from the sun during the day. That source disappears at night. Um, the important piece of this one is that in general, the ground is much warmer than the snowpack throughout the entire winter season. So that difference in temperatures from a warm ground to a cold snowpack means there's this constant flow of long wave radiation coming from the ground out through the snowpack um, and then going out to the air, to the atmosphere. Um, that occurs. Some of that long wave radiation that's coming from the ground through the snowpack can be reflected by trees, things like that. So you'll often find that snowpack melts quicker around the trees, maybe doesn't, as free, doesn't freeze as well overnight uh, around the, in the trees than it would out on an open slope. And that's because of that reflected long wave radiation being kept in by the tree cover. Um, the other source of, <clears throat> the reason that the cloud cover is important is that we've got long wave radiation coming from the ground out through the snowpack a portion of that will be reflected back towards the surface if we have cloud cover at night. So it's gonna keep our temperatures warmer, might keep us from having a very good freeze. Um, clouds themselves actually emit long wave radiation as well. So you've got part of it's being reflected and you've got clouds that are emitting long wave radi radiation, uh, keeps our snow surface from freezing um, very well at night. So that's the other piece. Here's your energy balance, really simple, right? <laughs> okay, so a solid overnight freeze. What do we need for perfect, safe conditions and good corn scheme? Um, that long wave radiation piece of the puzzle is super important. If we've got clear skies, that ground will constantly emit long wave radiation. The snowpack will freeze thicker and thicker and thicker overnight um, if you've got clear skies. Um, it's almost more important than for, uh, temperatures that are below freezing. Sometimes if I see an overnight temperature that's maybe right at 32 degrees, but we've had clear skies overnight, we've probably got a pretty solid freeze in that snowback despite the temperatures in there. So think about that, um, just this little piece. If you've got clear skies at night, your snow surface is probably about eight degrees centigrade colder than the air temperature on there. Um, so clear sky is super important. If we have that cloud cover, then the snow pack surface and the snow temperatures are probably pretty similar. Okay. So this melt freeze metamorphism process it does take time. Um, it's kind of interesting to read comments on some of the forums out there. <laughs> we had our first warm days not too long ago. People are thinking the entire snowpack has gone through this melt freeze process um, and everything is perfectly safe right now. So certainly not the case. It takes time and it varies by aspect and elevation. So steep south facing slopes, get the corn conditions, the safer snowpack first. Uh, lower angle terrain, 
and then other compass aspects, especially going around to the north facing terrain, is going to take some time before we have a safer snowpack and good corn skiing out there. Um, starts in the upper snowpack. As I said, if you dig down in our snowpack right now, you'll see a melt freeze crust on the surface, and below that is a midwinter snowpack. So it really hasn't changed all that much in the lower part of the snowpack. So it kind of starts from the top, works its way down. Um, this season especially, I'd be thinking about those deep slab avalanches and that weak layer near the ground, especially on north facing terrain well into the springtime. Uh, slopes that are above tree line and north facing will hold on to that winter snowpack well into the spring and those winter weak layers as well. Um, I've seen a couple of years where maybe we had an above average snowpack, didn't see too many deep slab avalanches until we got into May, June, July, when that lower snowpack weak layer finally got wet for the first time. Okay, and think about those persistent weak layers, the facets, the depth or things like that. They're not going away, especially when we've gone back to winter this week. Um, those will stick around above tree line well into the springtime. Even though that snow surface might feel like it's frozen solid, think about those weak layers that are down there because once that surface thaws, then we're looking at possibly impacting weak layers that are down near the ground. <clears throat> okay. And just a couple more things. So certainly springtime, you really got to know your slope aspect. Think about what time the sun's going to come up and which slopes are going to get hit by that sunlight first. So starting with the east-facing east terrain, and then the sun kind of moves around through the south-facing slopes and then around to the west side in the afternoon. So we like to plan our days so that we're getting up there just as that snow surface is thawing. You've got that good corn skiing. So think about slope aspects. Get a compass. If you don't know what your way around the mountains, this is a really, really useful tool. Um, Generally, in the springtime, we're out the door by a headlamp. It's not uncommon to leave on a tour in the spring, three, four in the morning, depending on where you're going, how big of a day you're planning. So get up early. Um, plan on being on the summit of your peak not long after sunrise. So generally, we don't have to deal with the trail breaking end of things in the spring. We're walking or skinning really quickly on the snow surface. So it goes fast, but you definitely want to be up high early uh, in your day. And <clears throat> one of the things I like to think about on my tours is you get up, let's say you're above tree line, you're at 13,000 feet. I see a lot of people hang around and wait until that snow softens on the summit of that peak. And that's ideally what we want to ski. But think about skiing three or four or 5,000 vertical feet down a slope, what's gonna happen at you know, 9,000 feet where it's been above freezing for hours and hours and hours. So when I think about safe travel, I wanna avoid those slopes when they're completely saturated you know, in the middle part of the day. And in order to do that, I think about skiing off the summit of a peak when it's still slightly frozen. So it might not be the ideal um, conditions but it's going to get you the safest avalanche, uh, safest avalanche conditions for that tour. By the time you hit the middle part of your descent, you've got perfect corn skiing, um, and hopefully that will continue all the way to the valley for you. Might start to get a little thicker and sloppier as you get down to the bottom, uh, but I generally like to leave the summit while it's still just a little bit frozen. If you wait till it's thawed on the summit, by the time you get below tree line you're probably going to be waist deep in a saturated, dangerous snowpack in there. So think about breaking that up into, into thirds. Maybe a little frozen, unpleasant skiing at the top, but that's going to buy you some safer conditions at lower elevations. And that's all I got. I'll take any questions if you guys, if you guys have them. And if not, we can move on to our discussion. Just when you thought moguls were safe. <laughs> so uh, would, would our snowpack, because you were saying that uh, above that really weak, large layer that we have, 
you know, you told us that above that it seemed fairly stable, and, and if it were like that, didn't have that weak layer, would we have like a pretty solid um, season as far as like safety? Would it be a lot safer without that really? Yeah. I mean, because what I've noticed is that this snow in, in the past few years anyway, it's been more, it's been wetter, heavier, more like maritime, more like, you know, stuff that's closer to, yeah. Yeah, good question. So unfortunately we're stuck with that lower snowpack weak layer. That's gonna haunt us for a while, but the maritime climates tend to have better spring skiing as well. Uh, the smaller the grain size and the higher the density in that snowpack tends to make it better for corn skiing in there. Um, what we see in the springtime here is when that snowpack starts to get wet and melt, it disappears rapidly because the grain size is so large and the pore space in between, in between the grains is so large uh, that it just shrinks and shrinks and shrinks, it goes away. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a very spooky snowpack right now, the structure of it. It feels strong, it feels supportive when you're walking on it, but when you know what's at the base of it, I'm kind of horrified as to what's going on out there right now. So it, it could be good, but I'm not gonna rule out these deep slab avalanches well into the spring this year as well. So especially, especially north facing terrain. So. Thanks, we'll move on. Okay, that was great, thanks. We'll have uh, our guest speaker come up here now. I, uh, I did a radio interview today and, and the, the interviewer asked me if I had ever been caught in an avalanche and I was open and honest. I, I, got, I got caught in a major avalanche in Alaska about 15 years ago and, and today was the first day that I ever shared that experience and he kind of coaxed it out of me saying that, you know, you can learn a lot from, from people that have, have firsthand triggered these things and, and been involved in them. Um, but it was hard and it was, uh, it was embarrassing. It was, it brought back a lot of bad memories. And, and I can say that that experience, uh, it changed the way that I drive. It changed the way that I ride my bike. It changed definitely the way that I ski the backcountry. So I have a lot of uh, respect for you sharing with us. And um, so I'll hand the mic to you and, and thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Arabella Beavers. It's lovely to see a lot of familiar faces here tonight and some faces I don't recognize. Um, in a minute, I'm going to bring up Jason, my husband, who um, is going to talk to you about the experience of being in an avalanche. But first of all, I just want to reiterate what was just said. Nothing can prepare you for what you feel like when you've been through this experience. It is enormously humbling, and it makes you revisit your entire vision of what you think is important in life. And it actually increases your love of skiing. I'm going to share that with you as well. Here is a picture of us skiing on Independence Pass. This is actually me the day before. And as you can see, it's a beautiful bluebird sky and a lovely mellow pitch as we foresaw it. And I've put the title, we all love to ski in the back country, but what if? Um, I just wanna talk you through the series of events, and if anyone has any questions, anything I say and you would like to ask anything, please put your hands up and I, I can pause. Um, but to start it off, we had planned to have a second day out. Um, the initial pits from the day before were showing some better signs for us. Um, there were some more moderate reports coming on the uh, CAIC. I'm a huge supporter of the C CAIC. And one thing I found um, from researching a little more afterwards is that I need to know how to use that to even better knowledge myself and my team. Um, we checked the reports, it was a beautiful day. We knew there was some weather coming in, but we felt that that was gonna be later. Um, and our backcountry plan was that we were going to ski a similar aspect. So, do I just press that one there? And this map here that Brian provided for us shows you pretty much where we were skiing. Excuse me while I use this gizmo here. 
um, up on Independence Pass. This is the ghost town here. Um, we were at mile marker 56, utilizing what we felt was lower angle terrain. Same place. We were in exactly the same place the day before. Um, as we arrived at the site, we decided to talk about our back backcountry plan, where we all felt we wanted to ski that day. It was a discussion amongst the team. One thing I will tell you is that your team dynamics are the most important thing um, in, in any backcountry experience. You need to have total and utter faith in the people that you're skiing with. And I will share with you right now that those people I was skiing with that day, their bravery and courage is why I'm standing here today and why they're still alive today. Uh, it's really, really important that you have that communication between you. So we decided that we were going to go for some safe travel techniques and the story unfolds. Um, this is a Google Earth picture that Brian took for us. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, where were we? Yeah, we'll have a look at that on the next picture. I can't really show you here, but this next picture is going to unfold the story for us. Okay, this was the avalanche that we were caught in, and I'd just like to give you some, um, some train of events that led up to this um, as the day started. Unfortunately, I don't have a lot of pictures. One thing I've learned in the aftermath is that you, if you are involved in an avalanche, it's probably really good to record some of this stuff. But when the adrenaline is rushing and you're trying to get people to where they need to go, i.e. the ER, <laughs> you probably don't think about getting the iPhone out and taking pictures. So uh, forgive me that we've only got this one currently. So we had used a path from this side. We'd come up through the trees using what we felt was safe uh, travel techniques. We had crossed here one by one into the tree line here. You can see this path here. We'd come up through the trees. And this point here is where the story unfolds. We were in constant communication all the way up. It was a lovely day. All of us talking, really sharing uh, our, our love of, of what, where we were and what we were doing. Once we got to here, this is where all hell broke loose and the story started to unfold. One team member stepped into the um, above tree line area, at which point I heard a very large whoomph. And trust me, it was like the sound of an explosion. It was absolutely huge. At which point I looked up and said to my team members, nobody move, nobody move. We need to put our backcountry exit plan into play right now. What we had discussed was utilizing these trees here if anything was to go wrong. And so at that point, shouted, everybody head for the trees. As you can see, the line of the propagation went all the way up here, across this ridge, all the way across. And I believe that far across, Brian, am I right? Into, into here. So it, as you can tell from this picture, it was pretty enormous. At this point, three team members were able to come into the trees Unfortunately, uh, Jason, who had um, a, an outward-facing position, he was facing outwards. As he turned around, his ski was ripped off, and so his movement was extremely compromised. His aim was to try to head for these trees here, but unfortunately, he ended up getting carried to this point here. There were two avalanches that hit. Um, the first one came from above here. The second one, I believe, came from this direction here. And the largest problem that we had was hang fire in this area here. An enormous amount of slab, sort of avalanche, still left to go above us, which was causing us a pretty big problem, I can say. Um, the one thing I can describe to you is the wall of smoke that comes in your direction. You assume that when you're caught in an avalanche that the snow is going to go this way. Mm -mm. It came this way. I mean, you'd be forgiven for thinking that it's coming straight at you. That's what it felt like. Um, and so as the second avalanche was hitting 
the amalgamation of the two created an enormous wall of, of smoky, snowy, blasting, explosive danger coming in your direction, basically. And I'm sure Brian can explain a little bit more what that was. Um, at this point, I started to scream for the other team members to see if I could get contact with anybody. I gathered that one of my team members was here, one was here, and I knew that Jason was involved in the slide. Unfortunately, the second one hit him pretty quickly. At that point, we literally just had to wait it out. And I was in here holding onto a tree for dear life. And I can tell you that by holding onto that tree, I pulled myself above the debris, and it was so, so much the debris, it pulled the skins off the bottom of my feet, of a, a bottom of my skis. Yes, Tracy. Yeah, I'm sorry, I should have reiterated this earlier. We were still skinning at this point. We were not skiing. We were skinning up this mountain here with the intention of either skiing this mellower terrain here, or if we felt that the pits were good, we could have potentially gone up here, skied this slope here and down. We were really undecided at that point, um, but Jason will probably talk more about that when he comes up. Okay, going into uh, where we found Jason, he was buried here. Um, I had one person up here and one here, and myself here. We had to remove the person from the hang fire to get down to Jason. If we had moved in the wrong direction, all of this could have come down on top of us, and that was a major worry for, I think, the whole team. So um, we, we immediately recognized that there was a potential danger with this, and decided that we had to be very careful how we moved towards Jason. So the member that was above tree line had to come around and underneath so that he didn't put any pressure or any movement anywhere near what was still left to go. And then myself and my other teammate managed to cross over to the area where he was. Quickly finding him, we dug him out. He was only buried up to his chest, but nevertheless was in a lot of pain and obviously very, very aware that uh, he'd just been through a, a big avalanche. The frustrating thing was, was that we couldn't get straight to Jason. Uh, he was here and where we were standing with the hang fire, we had to really have a plan to get to him where he was without putting ourselves at further risk. So there was a point there where you have to just stop. You have to look around and see what's, what's going on. What is the situation here? If we'd have all just started rushing towards him, I believe the tale would be a little bit different. So the one thing I felt we did right was we took a minute just to think, what do we need to do here? Again, that's where the bravery and courage of my teammates came in. I also believe that continued education is an amazing thing for yourself. I like to think that I try to do as much training as I can. Um, I know I could do a lot more, but because of the training I'd had, I really did know about stuff like hang fire and what if this could not be over yet um, and how to move to get to the people that needed help. So we quickly got to Jason and dug him out. It was quite clear from a quick medical assessment that he had a potential fracture on the leg. I was worried about a femur fracture, which I was mightily uh, pleased to find out that it wasn't later on, but we knew we had to extradite him from here pretty quickly. We had one team member who was using approach skis and a snowboard, um, and so having been in a scenario like this before, I decided that it was probably a really good idea to utilize the snowboard as a sled. Um, and the picture that Brian showed you of the debris of the avalanche, that's exactly what it's like. I mean, this stuff here is already covered in seven to 10 inches of snow, which happened two days later. So even though this is covered in new snow, you can see the type of debris we had to get over. Those big chunks that you saw in Brian's picture. You try getting someone down that on a snowboard <laughs> when great big 10-foot walls of snow are in front of you. Um, I have to say that what we did have on our side was we had an extremely talented snowmobiler in the team. We'd used snowmobiles to get up here, so the snowmobiles were parked on the road this team member actually managed to snowmobile up here to here. These lines in the snow here that you can see are walls of snow. What I understand from talking to people was that there wasn't enough 
um, else, um, it wasn't steep enough a slope for the snow to naturally run out. And so it built up into these huge walls of snow where the snow had nowhere to go. What you can't see from this picture is these walls were about 10 to 15 feet high. And we were trying to get him over these walls. Well, that was a pretty, a pretty tall feat. And I think the person that we had down here who'd gone to get the snowmo snowmobiles ready had noticed that we were really struggling with these and amazingly managed to drive the snowmobile up to this point and then brought Jason down and out. Um, <clears throat> the snowmobiler managed to get Jason up back up to the road and Jason actually got on his own snowmobile and snowmobiled himself out. <laughs> so, and he was in the ER by 3.45. So it was a very quick get out, um, considering where we were and what had just happened. Um, and then when I got to the ER, the first thing I did, I didn't call his mum, I didn't call my mum, I called this man here, and Brian will vouch for that. Um, one of the things that I'm a huge advocate of is sharing knowledge. This is a very, very difficult thing to stand up here in front of friends, colleagues, peers, and say, hey, you know, we were caught in an avalanche. It's quite a humiliating experience. You'd be amazed how many armchair quarterbacks you have coming up to you and telling you what they think of you um, in all sorts of places. The supermarket seems to be a really good one, the grocery store. But, um, <laughs> so, yes. That's a good question. The first settling that we heard, we are aware of it being around about 11.50, um, somewhere in that region. Our turnaround time was going to be 12.30. That was the plan. Um, perhaps potentially a little late for that day. I'd now, without further ado, like to introduce to you uh, Jason, who is going to come up and really talk you through how it feels to be carried and buried in an avalanche. So, uh, there you go. And then, and then, guys, I'll come through and do a summary afterwards and take any questions. Yeah, the yeah. No, the point. The point. Yeah. Yes. I don't need that. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, um, as the avalanche is coming towards you and, and, and it, you're being carried through it, the amazing feeling is the feeling of being sucked under. And so by holding onto the tree, what I managed to do is keep pulling my, my feet up above the, above the debris. As it was passing under as you? As it was passing under me. Yeah, yeah, definitely. The one thing that really shook me was the fact that my skins were ripped off. But I had really fat powder skis that day. I had a 114 underfoot. And I believe that that was, float, was a flotation device for me. I think it really helped the fact I did have fat skis on that day. But we'll, we'll pass over to Jason. I don't need that. I got this. All right. Um, oops, there's a question. My only question is uh, if you do get caught in the debris coil, obviously you can put the top part of the tree. But can you kind of slide around? Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't explain that very well. That was, um, the back country, country plan was to head for the trees if anything did go wrong. And when I say head for the trees, I obviously mean the, the leeward side, the downward side of the tree. The idea being the tree would take the, you know, the initial um, flow and that you would be as protected as you could be by being behind a tree. Um, so that was... Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. That was the idea, was to be behind the trees. And we were lucky. The trees were really big up there. I mean, they were big, you know, good sizable trees with lots of sort of branches coming off them that we were able to hang on to. So, yeah. Um, all right, well, I'm Jason Beavers, Arabelle's husband. And I'm just, first of all, I'll tell you, I'm lucky to be here. I sh probably shouldn't be here. Uh, I'm just, if you can see how big that is, I don't think anybody could have lived through it. And some of those pictures that Brian showed earlier of other app slab avalanches, that's just how big the slabs were that came down towards me. And it's just, you can't imagine how big it is. And um, so, you know, as Arabelle said, we'd skinned up through the trees and we stopped here and we we're just going to go up just about to right this little rock outcropping. You can't tell there. But 
I made the mistake and let us do it. We should have stopped at tree line and just come out here and skied down this little mellow like that. But uh, I got a little greedy and we decided to go up a little further. So that was an, a, a bad mistake right there. And the other mistake I think uh, I learned from Dick Jackson is uh, leaving the house in the morning. <laughs> you know, make the proper decision in the morning. So we did leave the house that day. And we, our second mistake was, you know, we got a little greedy and we left the safety of the trees. Uh, so I was about right here. The other party member was about up here. He was in the miracle zone. Somehow he didn't get hit or uh, didn't slide on him. But uh, when Arabelle said um, she heard a whoomp, I sort of turned around. I looked back this way, and I saw a settling here and one here. And they weren't that big, and that would have been OK. But then they propagated around, and as she said, all the way over to here. So I'm here, and I decide, well, I better try to make it back towards the trees. And uh, I think maybe the snow settled on me, and it took one of my skis off, so I was even slower. Um, one thing I learned, too, <laughs> don't try to go straight across the slope when the avalanche is coming. Try to go downhill a little bit to get a little speed, even though you got skins on. It's going to help a little bit. But uh, so I didn't get very far, and I saw, I turned around, and I saw a wall of snow probably coming at me, I don't know. 100 yards wide by 30 feet high. And at first, it doesn't seem like it's coming that fast. And then, of course, the closer it gets, the faster it's moving towards you. And uh, I had no choice but to just get ready to take it. So I shoved my abalone in my mouth and covered my head. And the next thing I know, I was somehow being tomahawked and being buried and uh, being pummeled by huge amounts of snow, large amounts, big blocks, and getting my face shoved down in the snow so far. It was very, very dark. Uh, but I kept sort of swimming, uh, trying not to resist the slide. And uh, you know, you, my life didn't flash in front of my face, but I did have plenty of time to think about, like, I hope I live. Oh my God, that last one's going to kill me. Uh, I thought about my wife uh, quite a bit. And then, yes, I did, in the good way. And, uh, and then it, it sort of somehow spits me out to the side. And personally, I thought I was here. But evidently, I was here, around there. But I didn't know where I was. So when I came up, I make visual and voice contact with all the party members, which was very good, you know, and I'm okay so far. And then, you know, we were like, hey, 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 you know, yelling at each other, everything's hunky-dory. Then I hear, I think Arabella say, oh my God, here comes another one. Well, for some reason, my Avalon pack is not on me, and I don't know why. I couldn't tell you. I don't know if I'd just taken it off to help. I don't know what it but it wasn't on. I didn't have it on. But it was within grabbing distance. So she goes, here comes another one. So I just had enough time to grab my Avalon around and, and hug it and shove it in my mouth and uh, get hit violently again by another wall of snow. And it might not have been as big as the first, but it was just as violent and maybe and not as long of his ride. But once again, I was in the darkness and everything like that and uh, then it ends and then I'm facing uphill and I'm buried up to here and I got one arm sticking out which is good because when you've been through a ride like that you get snow crammed everywhere and it's very disconcerting you have it in your ears up your eyeballs up your nose and then I had it way down my throat so the first thing I did was clear my air passage uh, with my finger and then I was you know vomiting and stuff like that to get it all out and then got my air passage going and that was to me I was okay <laughs> you know as long as I could breathe but that's sort of your first thing and um, then I made contact with the rest of the party so and of course I wanted to be um, dug out quickly <laughs>
But Arabella was smart enough to say, you know, you're going to have to hold your horses. We're going to have to, you know, reassess the situation before we come get you because, you know, we don't want to kill anybody else. So um, they came over uh, and dug me out, which was great. And, then, you know, I was pretty beat up, had snow crammed down everywhere else. So, um, you know, we tried to get the snow out of my pants because we were skinning up. My pants were unzipped. Um, so, you know, had to get that out. Um, first of all, we had to move to a safe spot and then, you know, reassess, see what's going on, get me warmed up, you know, get all the snow out from underneath you. That's really important. Uh, in my backpack, I had some ibuprofen and some Percocet, but probably I wasn't that bad off that I needed Percocet because I could still move. So I just had some ibuprofen with a little bit of water, you know, just in case you're going to go to the doctor, whatever, at the hospital. They don't want you to have anything in your stomach, so no water. So we start on the, on the rescue sled. Uh, of course, I lost all my skis. I lost everything. Um, coming down the rescue sled was pretty tough. Um, coming, it was really bumpy, and my legs were messed up, so I couldn't use my legs uh, as a brake on the sled. So my buddy would have to, you know, grab me by my coat or, I don't know, or I'd just go sliding in the snow and, you know, hit my legs and scream like a little kid. Ah, you know. So it was quite painful. And, uh, you know, I was getting pretty wore out when we got, when I got picked up by the snowmobile about right here, I was, I was tired. You know, I was cold. Uh, adrenaline had worn off. And I was, you know, I was just but tired, I was just, you know. So luckily he came up and got me on the snowmobile and gave me a nice little ride down. Um, I can tell you one thing, what I learned on the uphill, and normally I'm a snowboarder, but today we were skiing, but if you're a snowboarder and you're using approach skis or um, snowshoes and you're going uphill and you have your snowboard on your back, trust me, you do not want to be caught in this with a snowboard on your back. I would have been for sure, for sure dead. That would have, unless it would have just been ripped off the backpack. I don't know, but that's just for information for snowboarders. If you're going to snowboard in the backcountry, you better go with a split board. That's because it's it's not going to be pretty. And, it, and second of all, I've snowboarded for many years in the backcountry, and you're always at a disadvantage on a snowboard in an avalanche because it's not coming off. You know. So snowboarders, just be aware it's riskier for you in the backcountry. That's all there is to it. So that's a good lesson I learned. Other lesson I learned, uh, the Avalon, uh, don't worry about it. When the avalanche hits, don't worry about it. You need to s keep your wits about you, keep your uh, swimming, and keep a pocket in front of your face because the Avalon is going to get ripped out of your mouth no matter what. It's, that's just a given. So don't worry about that. Just keep your, uh, your face clear, and then when everything comes to stop, then put your abalone in your mouth and go from there. Because both times, mine, well, they were ripped out. I don't know where they went. And my mouthpiece was broke. So, uh, you know, hopefully you're, you're never in an avalanche, but you, these are little things that you should think about, or, you know, you know maybe it might help you one day. Uh, yeah, it was uh, pretty brutal, but... Uh, Everybody said, did you call Mountain Rescue? And I was going, well, we didn't. You know, we had three people there, and self-rescue is the best. And I learned a long time ago, I think in one of these classes, if you self-rescue, you're 100% pretty much going to live. If you got to wait for somebody to come get your butt, uh, your chances of survival start going down proportionately, you know, with time. So if you ever do get in your situation, hopefully you got a good team, and you're just going to have to bite the bullet and get out yourself if you can. So that's the main thing is to get yourself out, you know. Um, just be prepared for that. And that's about all I have to say. It's a very humbling experience, and I'm just so happy to be here. That's, yeah, you know. <laughs> it's, uh, I'll go back in the backcountry, but I'll be uh, making better decisions, that's for sure. And you don't get caught in an avalanche just by accident, I don't think. 
you know, that might be the case. But I think if you're in an avalanche, you've made at least one mistake and maybe more. So I've learned a lot from this, and uh, hopefully we're going to keep trudging along in a safer way. Thanks. Enjoy that. Okay, so um, I'm just going to give a quick summary, and then we'll throw the floor open to questions um, for either Jason or myself. Uh, so going back to this original picture, you know, the reason we live here is because we love to ski. And Jason just brought that up. Will we as a team never go back in the back country again? That would be such a shame, and I'm going to say no right now. Um, but we will definitely look at uh, different ways of approaching uh, what we do. And the one thing I would say is, having spoken to a lot of friends who are, so say, experts in the field, I understand that there's a need now to look at the bigger picture. This obviously propagated from a long way away. We remotely triggered this avalanche. And we need to start looking at that, the what ifs, the what's over there as opposed to just where you are intending to ski. Um, I have to reiterate that the, the good team dynamics saved our lives that day. And the fact that we took time to just take a deep breath before we rushed across to try and get to Jason to assess the situation. You really want to be there for your friends, but sometimes by rushing in, you could put yourselves and those other fellow members at, at risk. So it's really good to just take a deep breath. I've done a lot of training with beacons, and one thing I've always been told is, as you get your beacon out, take time to just assess yourself before you start rushing into to moving forward. So that's a really good point, too. Continual education is really important, and none of us could ever do enough education on stuff like this. I listen to Brian, and I'm just in awe of the knowledge he has, and I think that the more we can learn from him, from his website, and from our own education courses, take an Abbey 1, Abbey 2, even, even beyond that. Um, and finally, I'd just like to say that, you know, Mother Nature doesn't care if you're an expert, if you're you like to think that you're Joe Pro, or if you're just somebody who's out there for the first time, if you're, if you're rolling the dice, as it were, and maybe taking a chance, Mother Nature's going to have the last say. And she had the last say that day, and we were very humbled, very, very respectful of her and the experience that we went through. Um, and I'd just like to share that the community has been amazing uh, to us. We've had such an outreach of love and support, and we'd like to thank everybody um, for the way that they have treated us and been so kind in their words and shown us um, their support. So thank you very much. And if anyone's got any questions, we'd like to throw open the floor. <laughs> All right. Okay, uh, Tracy's question was, what was the time between the first avalanche and the second avalanche? Well, when adrenaline's rushing, you, you don't really know. But we would surmise that it was within a minute, a minute and a half. Having spoken to Brian, he sa says that that's quite unusual. Normally, they come within quick succession. But it was enough time for us to make verbal contact with one another, uh, which tells me that it gave us enough you know, time to settle ourselves and visualize where we all were. So I would say b between a minute and a minute, a minute and a minute and a half, Tracy. Yeah, good question. Yes, Scott. Uh, you to discuss earlier what, what you had filed the previous day. You can mention the same question to go back again. That's a great question. Yeah. Scott asked me if the great day that we'd had before um, might have, you know, um, affected our judgment for day two. Absolutely. We've all been in the back country where we've had that beautiful experience. Everything's gone right. The high, the adrenaline from that great day out. Yes, you know, you want more. It's like a drug. We love it. You know, put your hands up here. Who doesn't love going out and getting fresh powder turns? And I'd ask you why you live in this valley. Um, I definitely think that that was a major factor. We'd had a good day the day before. We'd been skiing very mellow terrain as you can see um so yes we were gung-ho we were ready for more we wanted more so yep admit i definitely admit that yes sir this is more about the experience you uh, had with the, uh, the uh, 
Jason. Uh, no, I was, uh, when I grabbed my pack, I, uh, I, you know, I grabbed my pack, grabbed that, put the abalone in my mouth, uh, dove for some trees in front of me, but, you know, uh, that doesn't help. <laughs> Sorry, this is so, it's so massive. It's just like, you know, going out to the North Shore of Oahu or wherever and just trying to stop the big wave like this. It ain't going to happen, you know. So I got violently pushed down the mountain again. Mm, Arabella might know better than I do. It's sort of hard question, for me to tell. The question that Scott asked was how far Jason traveled on the second avalanche. And I think I can answer that. Unfortunately, I was in a position where I was having to oversee quite a lot of what was going on. And I'm assuming that from his first movement to about here, he was then brought to about here. So the second one took him a lot further than the first one. The second one seemed to be a lot more violent, though, um, you know, I, I'm only one member of that team, but it did seem to have a lot of power to it. And the, the wall of, one thing I'll tell you is the, the wall of, of explosive snow came from here. As you saw it cracking at the top, you knew it was coming towards you. And funnily enough, as it starts moving, it's actually quite slow. As it comes off from here, it actually starts moving quite slowly. And then it's almost like it goes into fifth gear. Suddenly it starts moving really quickly. And as the snow was hitting about here, then it start, started to build into this wall. And we talk about these snow blasts. And one thing I forgot to share with you earlier is when I was standing behind the tree and the snow blast came through, it, it, it feels like an explosion. It really feels like an explosion. So you need to prepare yourself for that. Yes, Lucas. Same area. Same area, same yeah. Route, same not, not the same route, no. One, one over. We were one over. We were on the one same as down. one over. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. In fact, the backcountry discussion that morning had been, should we utilize the same skin track that we had over here, at which point we had suggested that it would be a better choice to not u reuse the same skin track. This is a summer road that you can see here. And you can see some shadow faint lines here of some people that had skied in this area previous. Um, mm -hmm. So basically, this, snow, this summer route, here, the summer road here was a road that we were utilizing for skinning the day before. Um, but our backcountry decision was not to use that same route the second day. Okay. Yes, Tracy. Uh, I would say about the same time, uh, 12 was the turnaround point, so we were skiing by 12. The only difference on the day before was that we had three team members, not four. So a, a slightly smaller group, but um, three, three members who were also involved in this second day. Yes? No. The first day we were level with 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 the top of the trees here identical the way Brian will explain it better but it's it's almost identical aspect here to the other side um, sort of open mm -hmm. right yeah thank you uh, the question was was when we were in communication how were we communicating was it just shouting backwards and forwards yes and what you need to be really careful about is that, that, you know, that panicking, panic yelling. You need to communicate what you need to be said very calmly and very precisely. I had one team member who was up here who I knew couldn't move. And so although I could hear shouts and screams from somebody, when somebody you love is shouting and screaming, help me, help me, help me, your initial instinct is to go and do that. But luckily, from the training I think that I've experienced and from just knowing a little bit about this, I knew that we needed to take stock of where we were. And so my immediate thing was to verbalize to the team member above me, can you contact team member up here and tell him not to move? Do not move. We needed to wait for all the snow uh, dust to settle so we could see where we were. At that point, then, I started shouting to all the team members, Okay, is everybody okay? 
nobody move until I say move. Unfortunately, I think I was that bossy woman at that point. Um, you know, what will happen is naturally one of you will take what we'll call, the, I guess, the IC. You'll be the instant commander. One of you needs to take that role, or you need to de designate it before you start the day. Um, for some reason, it was me that day. It could have been any one of us. We were all as, as, as experienced as each other, but for some reason that day, I, I guess I felt it was my place to start taking charge and making sure that I communicated to the others my feelings that we needed to be very careful about the movement that we continued to make. And so when you are shouting to team members, it's important to get a confirmation that they have heard that. And so I actually, one of my other team members was absolutely brilliant. Every time I'd say to him, hey, could you relay this message? And I need to know he's heard that. That's exactly what he did. I was really lucky that I had three guys that day who they, they didn't, didn't question what, what, what we were all asking each other to do. Their courage and bravery was just second to none, and they did exactly what they needed to do. And that's why I'm standing here, is because that's what they did. Uh, any other questions? Yes, Paulo. Maybe you, uh, I don't quite understand the EVA and the schedule. Okay, good. So maybe you could talk that's about a good how you did that and what you used as the ideal okay. resource and what you would love to see that happen. So okay, the question, in case any of you didn't hear that, was how did we use the snowboard? And that's a very good question. I've actually been involved in an evacuation before um, on, a, on a different um, hill, which off, off of Highlands where um, somebody was involved where we had a snowboard that could be utilized as a sled. And literally, if you've got nothing else, a snowboard makes a great toboggan or sled to get somebody out. Um, what you need to do is decide whether th that you are going to have them on it and you're going to have two people either side of the snowboard assisting them down. Because if somebody can't walk, then you need to get them down off the slope. And, Obviously, using a snowboard as a toboggan is quite a good thing. Or another train of thought, which was something we tried first up, was to use it like a, like a t toboggan sled, with one person beh sitting behind Jason. But the problem was, was that his legs were so, so severely bruised and damaged that it was causing him a lot of pain. So at that point, we kind of um, had a little bit of a rethink and used the toboggan, just literally him sitting on it and he would go a little bit and try and stop himself with his feet, and then we'd have one team member slowing him down. My job um, was actually to come through the debris and try to choose the best route until the snowmobile came up. My secondary job was to keep an eye on this and this. What, what you can't really see from this picture here is where the avalanche went. This is a, about a seven-foot crown at the top there that, that looked like it could go at any minute. And so a large part of my job was to sort of keep surveying what was going on above us while my team member who was helping Jason literally put himself second to Jason and got him down through this. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> you know, you're kind of just watching around and just waiting for the next one to come straight at you. It's uh, quite disconcerting. Yes, in the back there. on top. I sort of spit out to the side. I, I don't think I was buried. Uh, if I was, it was just maybe the knees. It's sort of hard to, it was sort of a blur there. Uh, like I said, I can't remember if all my backpack was off, uh, but I know I, w I was not buried. That's because I could see these guys and, and you know, have voice contact with them, luckily. Okay, great. Any more questions before we wrap this up? Yes, sir. Keeping with it uh, more for Brian, Brian, uh, was this avalanche due to trigger easier from in the basin or from up higher on the ridge? I'm just curious what it looked like from the top, I guess, top of Jason Point. <coughs> oh, and just before I pass you over, I encourage you all to support CAIC, um, <laughs> really, seriously, because without the information that we all need, it, you know, obviously it puts you at risk. <laughs> yeah, I think given the conditions that day, we were dealing with these new wind slabs over that depth or layer. I think it would be equally as likely to trigger from the top or from below. 
like these guys did. It was um, unfortunately kind of right during the peak of that cycle of large, you know, natural and triggered avalanches during that time frame. So that wind slab was fairly widespread across the whole top of that photo. Um, I'm guessing these guys probably didn't see a whole lot of wind slab until they got right to that, you know, to that tree line elevation in there. But I think either above or below, you would have triggered it that day. Brian, I just forgot to add one little thing, you know, when I was talking with, you know, all the guys and stuff afterwards, you know, over the next few days. Uh, of course, we had the avalungs in there going like, well, what about uh, an airbag? Would that would have helped you? And I would say, yes, the airbag would have kept me from being buried uh, and going down low, but I would have still been on top, and I would have been pommeled pretty hard by that slab. But, yeah, I think the, an airbag would have helped, uh, that's for sure. You know, in the conclusion, it would have helped a bit. I might have still got beat up really bad, but uh, I would have been gone underground, which under the snow, which is very, it's not very fun at all. Yeah. May not have changed the broken leg, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I doubt it. <laughs> is there any telling whether the regular part of the bag is in the trigger guard or in the recent spot? It's hard to say, not having been there. Um, you know, likely it was one person in that group that initiated that, you know, a little collapse under their feet. It sounded like maybe it was Arabella, uh, but the, that weak layer was so widespread that that quickly traveled through that entire slope. So. <clears throat> Glad you guys are here. <laughs> Not necessarily. Yeah, not necessarily. I mean, the, the idea is that once that's... <laughs> yeah, the idea is when that slows down, that that airbag is a little lower density than the snow, and then you float towards the surface. It doesn't prevent the violent, you know, the violent tumbles, the traumatic injuries. The, uh, we've certainly had fatalities with airbags on as well as a result of, you know, hard slabs hitting trees, things like that. So. All the photos I got uh, were the day after, or this was two days later. It looked like it may have gone to the ground in a few places, but I couldn't be certain. It had filled in with new, new snow and new wind-loaded snow as well. I couldn't tell you. Um, Um, this is up valley by maybe two miles. Yeah. Would there have been expectations to see? Yeah, um, it would, I would say that this cycle of avalanches caught a lot of people off guard. And I think unless, you know, certainly we were writing about it in the forecast and we were kind of just starting to see some of these large avalanches occurring. And we certainly did write about it um, during that week that we were worried about the wind loading. We were worried about deep slab avalanches. Um, that information was in the forecast. Um, I think, you know, unless you've been following the weather and the snowpack um, all season long, it might have been a little difficult to see that, or at least the timing on that cycle of avalanches to hit that properly. Um, 
certainly an interesting cycle. The signs, you know, certainly the signs were there. Wind loading, lower snowpack, weak layer, um, things like that. And as she said, you know, a good day on the day before may have kind of played into that, into that situation, to that decision. You know the, is that that pointer? I don't know, thanks. Um, it's not, certainly it's up in the shade here. Um, this little portion of the start zone is probably upper 30 degree, maybe getting close to 40 degree range. Um, as you get down into this terrain from about this point down, um, you're almost below 30 degrees for the, for the rest of that area. Um, so short, kind of a short, steep start zone here. Um, obviously a historic avalanche path that runs down that way frequently. Um, the other thing to mention as we looked at these photos and from the two separate avalanches, if you look at this chunk of the start zone here, when that runs, it runs to here. So it almost comes across. And then this portion here, which was probably the second avalanche or the second portion of that, kind of runs more straight down. So certainly taking the time to look at some of the old historic clues, the tree um, damage in there uh, is worthwhile. And that one's not that obvious. It's uh, kind of interesting in this case that those two paths kind of cross each other right in the middle. <clears throat> so coming, yeah, yeah, we've seen avalanches triggered from well below this time. And one of the photos that I've uh, had up earlier with the gentleman standing next to that big block was actually triggered from probably about that distance from the, you know, the valley floor to it's about that path is about. They were, yeah. So they walked up where that photo was taken after it occurred um, to uh, take a look. So, yeah, I certainly don't. You know, if we're, if we're seeing conditions like that, we try and warn about it in the forecast, but, you know, if we're seeing people remotely triggering avalanches from long distances away, we try and make a mention of it. Um, and it's those days where you just got to be super conservative with your terrain. Yeah. <clears throat> Statewide or Aspen area? Um, you know, if we look at the Aspen zone, I actually haven't, Somebody asked me that question a couple, a couple of weeks ago. And what we have on the CAIC database is only avalanches that we've observed, the CAIC staff, or things that have been reported to us. And I would say for the Aspen forecast zone, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 150 avalanches or so that I know of. Our estimate though is that about 10 times that number actually occurs and they're either in remote areas and people don't see them or they just don't get reported to us as well. So that would, I haven't looked at it this week, but I'd guess around 150 or so, slightly above average as to what we see reported this time of year, most seasons. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, <laughs> You know, the day of this avalanche and then the following two days afterwards, pretty much everything below and up valley did run. Um, so I think that potential uh, naturally, yep. Um, I think, again, it's hard to sell. I wasn't able to get up there um, that weekend afterwards, so I didn't get a good look around. I have a feeling that actually during this avalanche that some stuff up valley actually did run at the same time as well. Um, you know, in a way this, terrain, these snowpack conditions remind me of an incident we had up on Sunshine a number of years ago. I'm going to space the year right now. Um, but in that particular avalanche, the guys triggered a small slab on one slope, but then that failure propagated half a mile or more, three quarters of a mile up the ridge, triggering numerous more other avalanches as well. So they do happen, certainly. You know, I think we were, we had that initial warm up, the third maybe, is that right? Second, third, somewhere in there? This was the set, yeah, kind of the start of the second warm up. I don't, you know, looking at, I spent a lot of time looking at temperatures in that cycle. 
Um, it didn't seem to affect the Alpine all that much. I think this was more related to wind loading, um, especially on this day. Well, this was two days after that storm on the 5th. It would be my guess that that warm-up didn't, at least on this aspect, didn't contribute it, to it. Just a guess, though. I'm not the expert. <laughs> All right, we'll let it go there. Thanks. All right, I don't know about you, but I need a shot and a beer. That was, uh, but that was, that was great. Thanks, guys, for sharing with us. Uh, huge props to uh, Brian and the Colorado Avalanche Information Center. Um, thanks to Grassroots for filming this. And uh, support the CAIC uh, whenever you can. Please also help support uh, Powder to the People. And uh, as important, you know, let this go viral. Tell people to check it out on Grassroots. And, uh, you know, tell people what your experience was like. And, and, and let's uh, have some more of these next year and, and try and get a lot of people involved and educate people and, and keep it going and, and have a safe and happy spring and, and some great adventures. Um, so thanks, and uh, we will talk at you later.